uh, our submission uh, towards the, the computation, uh, computa what's well, called computation, but it's for the submission of the Design Core Putt Putt competition, which goes on almost every year. Uh, so Design Core is part of a larger umbrella that's called uh, the Tr Detroit Month of Design, which goes on for about a month, and they have a variety of events that they have competitions and people win installations and they participate in these. So this one, the putt putt competition, it's uh, based on a 10 by 10 design. Uh, you're with, restricted by a 10 by 10 space and it has to be installed and taken down within an hour and you have to launch it at Easter market after dark and light up Livernoy. So our concept when we first started this was let's have a, a design that people can come and play over and over again, that they're not gonna get bored of, that uh, it's always a unique experience when you do this. And for order to do that, we leverage computation uh, to do that. Because computation, you can have uh, a large amount of data uh, and you're able to manage that. And you also use that data to generate designs. So the first thing we did was with our 10 by 10 space, we divided up into uh, a five by five grid. So that was able to give us design options or, or able to break it up into modules to create these different designs that we can shift around, but also will help us with the portability because we have to take this down and put it back together in, within an hour. So to use these tools, we use Rhino and Grasshopper, which are visual programmers. So to design with this, it's usually the opposite of how you typically design. So when you typically design, you'll start big and you work your way to the detail. With generative design, you start small and you let it populate big. So we focused on just that two by two module. So the first thing was the ball, was the curve of the ball, the actual like, okay, we have the motion of the ball going through. And we defined that by just three points. Is a simple three-point curve, and we overlaid that three-point curve on a three-by-three three grid. Well, next, we isolated four points within the center of this grid, and we assigned it a value. So when the when the curve of the ball approaches these points, these points are going to move up vertically. And that's a simple just math ratio of you know the distance is y, and we're just going to take the half of y, and that's going to be the vertical. And once we establish those points, it's a simple, we're going to create a, generate a surface from those points. And this is just a simple grasshopper script that we used. And it's defined by three variables, the three points that define that curve. And we use that, with that, we generated 8,124 modules. So that may, so we actually generated 8,124 modules. We, uh, we didn't just say we, we've made a, that those are the options. We actually had the script run through all the options and generate an image. And uh, we just uh, assembled the image in a short video. So what, what do you do with 8,124 modules? That's the next thing. So what? You generate all these modules. What do you do? Well, we have to start classifying. You have to start understanding what, what their potentials and opportunities are. So first we added up all our variables. So point A, B, and C, and we established a domain for each of those. And that within that number and within the domain that falls in, we classified it as a par five, par four, par three. And that's how we were able to start breaking these all these modules into something a little more manageable. So then once we had a 10 by 10, we had our 10 by 10 site and we arranged about we arranged five uh, modules for each one, and of course we had four neutral modules because we needed a, a space where someone could lay the ball and start to actually hit the ball, and of course our our one module that had the hole in it, and just with all those we had about ten thousand one hundred fifty five different design options that someone can come up and use. We also expanded that once we selected one of those. 10,000, we had about 12,500 different options where we could actually pick up the panel and rotate it around. So it gave us even more options when uh, when some uh, player is using it. 
and we were selected to be one of the finalists. And it was a big, it, it was a big celebration. We were really happy. But at the same time, we have to somehow build this thing. <laughs> so the first thing, our first idea was, okay, what if this thing was made up of a series of panels, and we had 3D printed standoffs, and the standoffs were attached to the subsurface, a little substrate. Um, and uh, we, we picked 3D printing just because that was the most accessible digital fabrication tool that we had. Uh, we were a little nervous with all the, the unique uh, triangle panels because we're pretty limited access with a CNC machine and we knew we were going to have some very difficult angles, but we were pretty confident we could find someone to get it lined up for a few hours. Another obstacle that we came across was all our different 3D printers. So we had two other designers, me and another designer had our own 3D printer, and then um, Newman Smith had uh, two Ultimakers. And all these ran at different software and had different hardware requirements. So it became really difficult to have these things talk to each other, and uh, we were able to, and we essentially had to reformat our duplicator 4S and completely almost rebuild it to make it similar to these other ones. And we and that was because some of our parts were slightly different. We were about a sixteenth of an inch off on a lot of our parts. So it took us a while to kind of make sure everything's producing the same result. And also we noticed some small minor ones, just how the infills worked, how they created circles for the little drill holes that we were planning. So it was a it was a difficult task. But we were able finally able to get them to work. And we started finally to make rapid prototyping. Uh, and so these were just a few of our examples. Uh, we even had like nuts that we that friction fitted within each part where we dabbed adhesion. Um, there was parts where we just had a simple drill. We drilled right into the part. Um, we even had little parts that flared out. Now each <laughs> panel is unique and each one of these parts are unique. So we could have all these different flare outs and these flare outs were unique for each one. So it was almost like put together a puzzle, and we thought that could be a really quick way to assemble this thing. So this was our first mock-up panel. It was a simple flat panel. We just wanted to see if the, the triangles were actually were durable, that the, the diameter of the standoffs worked, and, uh, and it, we were pretty happy with it. I think it got us, it got us thinking of a, lot of, uh, a lot of different ways we can go about. Um, and now, every time when you add parts, different parts to this, uh, you have to, there's a lot more variables that go into this. So when we're dealing with wood, you have to deal with the expansion of wood, with the humidity, if it gets wet, um, how it reacts to uh, the plastic in the wood, how they react. If someone is routing it, if they didn't set up perfectly square, does it you know, have an error to that? What if the 3D printing isn't leveled all the way? There could be an error for that. For, so every time we had a connection, we had about a two to five percent tolerance, which starts to add up on our variables and how and how complicated the script gets. And this is just a, a quick blow up of how our updated panels will start to look like, uh, um, how we start to have these wing connections that fit right into it. Uh, we're also going to screw them right down. Um, and there's a lot of parts to these little panels. We're looking at almost 1,200 machine screws and 400 unique 3D prints. So uh, this was us put assembling our first mock-up, and we were, and it, of course, anytime when you do one of your first prototypes of mock-ups, it takes a while. Um, and so looking into the hours that we we're looking into assembling this thing. Uh, it took a long time, and the biggest one was the 3D printing. We were looking at 60. It took us 60, uh, yeah, 66 hours just to get this print panel printed, and then 64 of those hours was just the print time. Uh, and we're looking at a total print, a total project of 1,600 hours of printing. So uh, and that's total total hours in a month was 744. So we had to work fast and. Luckily, we had four 3D printers, so it took us probably about three days to generate a, a panel, which isn't bad, but we were it was still a very, I mean, any manager who sees that amount of time uh, 
there's a lot of risk and liability there because you could be 90% done on that long print and it could fail. And now you'd have to start up. Also, these 3D printers are also working with Newman Smith. If there's a big job that comes up, that's going to be taken up on time. So there's a big, big kind of worry mark about that. So at this time, our office was going through uh, an office renovation, and uh, Mod Interiors was was helping us out. And we got them on board and started talking to them about ideas, and they actually volunteered to help us. And Mod Interiors has some of the best machine, best hardware machines, CNC drill presses that. Uh, we can, I mean, it, it was, they have state-of-the-art stuff, and uh, we gave them one of the panels for them to cut. And uh, this thing cut ridiculously fast. Uh, when we did our test print, our test cuts on our CNC machine, uh, it took us an hour and a half for a panel. It took theirs 15 minutes, and that was not even on the fastest setting. So it was, it was a huge time saver, but we still had a large 3D print time. And I think we were at that point where we were, we were prepping to start 3D printing all these because time was ticking. So after a few conversations with Mod um, and our hesitation with the 3D printing on just the amount of time, uh, they suggested a, a different idea of what if we got rid of the 3D printing and we just stacked and laminated a whole bunch of wood and we milled it out. And we thought that was, at first we were like, okay, that kind of gets rid of the 3D printing and that's part, that also generates some of the aesthetic, but also it, it simplified things so much. And we were, and also it created an aesthetic I think that works better for a putt-putt course. And so I think right off the bat when we looked at the numbers and the parts that it took to assemble this thing, I think we were all really excited about it. And also, it simplified all our variables. So instead of all these different connections, all these different parts, it was really just we were looking at uh, five variables. And the, one of the biggest variables was just the thickness of the wood, because they wanted to stack up. If we had uh, one panel that was uh, five and three quarters, and they were like, and we're using one inch Baltic birch plywood, well, we could just modify the script to make it six inches, and then they could just stack six inch, six plywoods on top of each other instead of working, instead of having all this extra cutting time to get to that five and three quarters. So, utilizing computation, making that really, that really helped with the fabrication. Also helped how how we could communicate and how we could work together and making something that's more efficient. So this is, this is our machine. About two and a half hours, it generated that, and of course they put a nice clear coat on it. But it was pretty amazing about the amount of time and hardware that they had that would have reduced it. And it, the the great thing was this was something that we would probably never conceive of because of our limitations with the tools. They had the tools that they could do. We were really, like I said before, 3D printing was our really digital fabrication tool. We were limited with the CNC. With them and teaming up with them, we had all sorts of different, all sorts of possibilities we could because they had the machine and the knowledge to run it. And so we see it reduced uh, our our whole time by 95 percent. It was a huge time saver. And finally, we we started looking at uh, different materials. So MDF, there is an issue with MDF, and this is going to be outside um, as. MDF has a nice clean finish on top, so when you get rid of that nice clean finish, it's uh, it's uh, exposed to a lot of humidity. It's going to start to swell. Um, some of the, it could start to deform. So to minimize that, they always had to put a clear coat right on top of it right away. But if this was going to be outside, people are going to be walking around on it, stepping on it. Uh, the clear coat would start to wear. Then we start to get that exposure again. So Baltic birch was something that Baltic birch, because of the aesthetic, and also I think because of some of the, uh, the durability that it has compared to MDF, um, we we were more we were leaning towards that. 
So these are just some. These are actually taken a, just a few days ago. We're about to. Now this isn't finished yet. We're about to launch it very soon. Uh, it, we're we're actually receiving it uh, pretty quick here this Friday. But uh, this is just a quick uh, explode explode at exploded animax search. Uh, just how we're going to assemble these panels. We're uh, we're going to have of course our panels and we're going to have our plywood uh, subfloor, which was going to have a CNC holes right into it. So that's when we can move the hole anywhere we want to. They can pick up the panel. Users are able to customize their golf course any way they want to. And of course, we'll have the bumpers that can help uh, help contain the ball. And this is what it looks like assembled. So I guess I mentioned before, it's not finished yet. It is on its home stretch as we the panels are are almost all done. I think we're just putting a clear coat on them now. Uh, but I'm gonna leave you guys with this: that we're gonna, if you want to see the final result, come see us at uh, Easter Market after dark. It's also the same day at the AIA Awards, uh, and we'll also be at September 28th at Light Up Livernoy. And if uh, you're, if you can't make all of those, uh, you can always follow us at Newman Smith. Or uh, my or my own Instagram account, Inference Studios, or uh, just hashtag us at computation. Thank you guys. Thank you for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, did you design each one of these panels individually and then try to assemble them together just to see what the outcome would be, or did you look at it as a whole at the same time? We. So in when we had our. So if we asset, we asset, first we looked at them, um, um, we had the script run through all of them, and we again looked at the images and wrote data around. We uh, we picked out a few of them that we thought were pretty that had kind of the most range. Some of these were pretty flat, and maybe one or two panels were up and down. So there was also a, a manual process that we we went through on these panels. So it wasn't it wasn't just like we spat it out and we put it into pars. We actually looked at them and made sure, okay, is this this one has the most uh, dynamics elements to it. Did you run golf balls over them yet? Yeah, we actually we have, and you know, a oh, good thing we did because, uh, yeah, the one our, our first panels, it when it slows down, it does kick one of those cracks and it just follows that crack yeah. along. Uh, with uh, the full-on CNC routed ones, uh, they, they uh, I'll be surprised if anyone gets a hole in one on that. <laughs> it's really difficult. So yeah, we lined up a few of them and uh, hit, hit them around. We actually lined up our two mock-ups and uh, bumped them around. And did, like, yeah. Did you find with the actual ball that maybe you didn't need quite as much elevation to, to make things pretty difficult? Or? You know, it, it's funny. We we didn't go too much into make it how, how difficult or how easy we can get it. It was actually just more of us looking at, like picking out the ones that had the most difference. And we're like, okay, we want we want something that aesthetically has a lot of range to it. And uh, we didn't quite, we didn't look at like how much it, how difficult this thing could go. Yeah. Can I ask why uh, you chose to have these be triangles? Like, uh, when I think about my time with the grasshopper, which isn't much, um, and I know that there's ways to apply spline type mm -hmm. effects so that you have smooth, smooth surfaces. That would be more like a golf yeah. course golf feel course. to it. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. Yeah, the reason, one reason why we didn't pick more of a smooth surface was just the limited of our tools. So when we first got the, the go ahead to put to put together this competition, um, you know, you're always kind of like the first thing you do is stock, stock take of like, how can I, what, what are the tools I have? And that was the first thing was like, I don't know if we can do something really smooth. And because if we had the CNC machine earlier, it, I think that would have been a, a possibility. So if you were to go back and do it again sometime, you'd probably explore that opportunity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it was just that that idea of, okay, we knew we had limited access to the CNC machine, but we had unlimited access with 3D printers. Okay, we should probably make this more of a 3D printing one. And and making this whole thing out, th yeah, it was, I mean, just with those little standoffs, it was, 
an astronomical amount of time to 3D print, but so making a whole panel out of something like that would be out of uh, out of our reach, including with uh, four 3D printers. Was it like structurally stable to stand on? Yeah, actually, it, it was structurally stable to stand. That was the other thing because some of the pieces go up over six inches, and so we were like, "Well, this is a big panel. And it's a big panel for a three-quarter inch MDF." And uh, so yeah, it did. It does flex, and actually, because of that, we changed some of our connections. So we actually had a few nuts and bolts that we uh, screwed into, and over time, those popped. Because it just get, because the the wood would deflect, and over time it would just the glue and the friction fit of the nut would just pop out. So we actually switched to just a drywall drywall screw, and we just drilled it right through uh, the panel and into the 3D standoff. And the nice thing with the 3D standoffs is you can control the amount of infill. So each one has all these different layers built into it, and so when with that drywall screw went in, it caught all, it caught a lot of those layers, and it was hard to rip up. We found that to be a much more durable option. So despite how much time you spend on it, you learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, that was a, that was one hesitation was with uh, was when we were talking to Matt about about the ch that point of departure was like, man, we spent a lot of time on figuring out this 3D printing stuff and get it to work. But at the at the end of the day, we had to like stop and look at the design process. And was like, this is. We would have not gotten here if it wasn't for all that 3D printing and getting this. So this was a just a point of departure, and it's just part of the design process. And we have to honor that and be honest with it, and uh, and go with it because it because then at the end of the day we have to answer, well, why did we pick a design that took 95% more time and it cost us more money uh, to do? So it was like, yeah, this, yeah, the aesthetics are different, but it. I think in the end, it's a much stronger project. And you did this entirely at Newman Smith. Yeah, we with your own employees. With yep. So it was um, it, uh, it was uh, all, most of the time it was uh, um, me, uh, Trent Schmidt, and uh, Jason Baker. So we uh, us three designers uh, put a lot of time into this, and of course Mod uh, helped was uh, was right along with us too. I should we did that in. Off time, not, not it, company hours. Yeah, it was. You know, I think the. Yeah, we were. We were lucky. Company hours. Yeah. <laughs> no, we were. We were very fortunate that uh, New and Smith uh, allowed us to use some of our hours. I, you know, a lot of it was some of the like a lot of the 3D printing stuff went up with our personal 3D printers. Were uh, a lot of late nights on our hours, uh, because that was our 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 products and stuff that we wanted to fix up. But you know, Newman Smith was really nice uh, to allow us to use these hours. Um, and to do it, and uh, you know, we were pretty conscious on making sure not to spend too many hours. And we were also very lucky that Mod was able to donate some hours and help us out. So, but yeah, they actually uh, again, there's always hours that sneak up on you that we that you never anticipated on, and that's one thing is just the level of contingency that you should put on the assembling. Uh, uh, talking to Mod, like the amount of hours just to laminate all these uh, panels together was a lot longer than they were expecting. It sounded like I think they, they I just got the number of about uh, 37 hours mm -hmm. of just assembling, uh, laminating these together. And also, I was over, uh, I was uh, definitely over on the amount of hours I thought assembling our panels with the 3D printing it took a lot longer than I thought because we designed it so it was like okay it's just going to be a puzzle piece everything's just going to snap in but you know there was a few panels that were very close to each other that had the same pattern and it was like well where does this go and that threw off everything and something that we thought was going to take half an hour 45 minutes to do ended up taking an hour and a half sometimes two hours and we actually had to cut out a few things uh, just to make the assembly time faster. Originally we had a lot, of, we had the, the screws, we had a countersink on, we had a screw into the nuts and stuff and uh, took a lot of extra time. So we just used the drywall screws. I got one last question for you. This one's a little bit more of a curveball. Um, does Newman Smith participate in the construction event? Yeah, yeah. Newman Would Smith you use Rhino to assist in the generation of how to stack those cans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's 
Yeah, Neary Smith does participate in the can destruction. And uh, yeah, Rhino, anytime you're dealing with multiple, like hundreds of different units or hundreds of the same units, and you're configuring them in a, in a unique way, that's that's probably the best application for the Grasshopper and, and Rhino. It's just when you're dealing with that much units and information, it's a lot easier to manage, and you can on the fly change things. And I think that's the thing that saved us um, was just on the fly when we were changing parts, uh, tweak, you know, rapid prototyping those standoffs. All we had to do was click a button, and it updated everything. Okay. You know, 3D printed something. All right, the nut isn't really friction fitted on this print. Okay, all right, let's tighten it up on this one. And uh, and we were able to just click a variable, bake it, and then send it to the 3D printer. Yeah, because we uh, we were using a SketchUp to make our little Mario Kart dude. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We spent a lot of time on that. <laughs> yeah, that that would take a while on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would. But yeah, it's it's a great it's a great tool grass the visual programming is and it's just for me it's just going to be even more um, more important down the road it's things are just going to get more advanced it just seems like it automates things it calculates and um, it just makes things a lot easier when you're dealing with a lot of information all right well thank you everyone thanks for uh, showing thanks, up guys. thanks <laughs>